little white and white goatee and a piece of chicken, I look like Colonel Sanders. Several things. First of all, I have something to say about Curtis. In the morning after the storm hit, I called him from Natchez and I said, Curtis, I said, what's it like? He says, oh, it's a Monday night. I said, look, he goes, yeah, he said, I think there's a lot of wind, we have a bit of rain, but there's about maybe a foot of water or something in the retainment pond. It's good. That was about, what, 8 o'clock? 8.30, I'll help her loose. I didn't hear from him for a while because everybody's phones died. That's number one. The next thing I again want to thank you all for coming. I think a lot of you all went through this. I, mean, I don't know how to express it, but it doesn't seem like 10 years, but it seems like an eternity. You know, it just, it's hard to piece that all together. Now, before I start on the actual election, I have two videos I'm going to show you. The first one was one that I found. This was on WYES, I believe. It's kind of self-explanatory. What happened here, the TV station had a camera, security camera, and months after the storm hit, one of the technicians looks at what that thing was running. What it actually shows is the water coming into St. Bernard Parish. Riley, yeah? In a storm surge, turns out that the security camera at the Fox 8 transmitter in Chalmette was rolling as the building was swamped. The first sign that something is amiss comes at 8.24 on the morning of August 29. The security camera points through the station's tower to the east toward the Mr. Go. A white line of foam appears in the distance, marching on the transmitter site. Something is wrong, really wrong. Fox 8 engineer Ralph Hartwell says it was weeks before they could retrieve the security tape and months before they were able to look at it. We thought it might be there because the security system runs 24 hours a day. Nobody really knew if the camera worked that day until engineers rebuilding our studios hooked up the machine. Today we looked at it and, whoa, this really shows what happened. It also shows how quickly it happened. The water at this point at 8.30 is how high? Well, really, at the transmitter site right here, there is no water. It has not quite reached the outer level of the fence yet. That took only a few minutes, and by 8.37, there's four feet of water at the transmitter site. Now the water's deep enough that the wind is actually kicking up waves on the surface of the water. The security camera captures lots of debris floating by, small stuff, and the not-so-small. The box trailer is beginning to appear in the corner, upper left-hand corner of the screen. At this point, the electricity in St. Bernard has long been out. The camera runs on generator power, but it's time is running out. The generator will go underwater and that's the end of the video. The camera rolls as the generator struggles for life. It finally goes under. And then, just as suddenly on the tape, the camera snaps back to life. Power is restored to the transmitter nearly three weeks later. Most of the water has been pumped out. There's still some water laying in the scene in the background. Hardwell says what surprised him was how the water came up. There might have been time for someone riding out the storm in Shelhead to get to higher ground. It's not like a tsunami, no, it's, it's kind of creeping death. But not much time. At least 12 feet of water invades the transmitter site. It happens in less than 20 minutes. The transmitter building is about a half a mile from the levee, so the initial surge was certainly higher than 12 feet. Right, that's the first video. Now the second one, I don't know if you all know Rocky Beccarello. He's the guy that took his femur trail to Washington, D.C. and tried to have dinner with George Bush. Well, he was down at his home filming, so you can see what it was like for someone actually in the eye of the storm as it comes in. Notice the rock. Oh, yeah, they're going to have one of them. 
You're on a loss. This is an aerial shot, a satellite shot. Look at this. There's really nothing there. Here's the city of New Orleans. Here's how the friend used to go. Lake Bourne. Oh wait, the word Bourne is French for unformed eye, because it's not really a properly formed lake, so that's how it got its name. You can see how the birds would go. The only thing you have are legs. Just to go. This is what really did this in. It was begun in 1957. Then there's a great shot. These are our dignitaries for the two by four on top of the detonator, setting off the first ceremonial explosion to start the canal. But notice the foreground, how they had to cut down all the cypress trees so you could see the explosion. Gives you an idea of what was back there. This is a shot after the canal was just being built. Look at the cypress trees. Look at the cypress trees. They cleared this area because that was their working area. Look at the canal. I want you to look at the suburb in relation to this. But this is what it looked like probably before it opened. They were still constructing it. Look at that right now. Look at this. It went from 500 feet to 3,500 feet in some areas with the erosion. Because they kept digging it out, and the sides caved in, digging it out, the sides caved in, it just continued, continued, continued. This is showing the erosion. This is an area right here. You can see the top, that's the industrial canal in uh, part of Mr. Go. You can see how the land just completely disappears. So Mr. Go destroyed 80,000 acres of wetlands and cypress swamp and made those vulnerable for a storm. All that would keep those tidal surges up, but it was gone. They created a 76-mile expressway right into the back of New Orleans and St. Bernard Parish. And there she is. And all the wetlands around here were destroyed by the salt water that came up. Okay? This is a close-in shot, so you can see, look, the, the board of Lake Bourne didn't exist anymore. And this is before the storm. It's all dead. Times begin. Portia sent an order to deteriorate washes, deteriorating at an accelerating rate. Land loss along this to go 74 to 83, 397 acres a year. 83 to 90, 274, 1990 to 2001, 1,157 acres per year. Three times, just a few years. The one who allows the current. Hello. Try salt water. <laughs> but the core doesn't like to admit to things like that. They don't like to admit, admit they make errors. What we are seeing now is a marsh being lost at a rate that exceeds the international, the intentional digging of the canal. You couldn't intentionally dig it as quick as it was disappearing. Bro bill. Remember the bro bill? We saved 8,400 acres in 14 years. My like trouble is we lost 201,000 acres in the same amount of time. God knows what it costs that. It's just the projects is just so big. What are you going to do? Hurricane Katrina, when it came through the Rio, we usually say we lose 25 square miles a year. And I remember I was with Richard Brown, who was a nervous person. He had getting a lot of information. He had a map posted on the wall, and I looked at it, and I said, Richard, this isn't for real, is it? He goes, yeah. It was the government estimate. We lose 25 square miles a year. Between Katrina and Rio, three weeks, we lost 214 square miles. It's five years, three weeks. There's a huge gap there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah no, no. This is what a healthy cypress swamp would look like. That's what it's supposed to be. Good to be any other. Look at that. That's the way nature planned it. Look at the size of that tree. A friend of mine worked for the Boy Lumber Company and a picture in his office of three lumberjacks holding broad axes alongside of each other. The background was a cypress tree. Some of them were about 97 feet around. That's how big they were. But they were all harvested in the 1870s and 1880s after the Civil War. So we began destroying things very early. This is what it looked like after Mr. Bell. You remember that? Not even these exist anymore because the wind and the tide took them down. That was just open water. But those were the tombs and that was referencing. But then we had other problems. Cute little island with it. Not really, it's an ugly dance though. And the theory about that's interesting. You know, I said, well, you know, the McElhaney family had them when the storm came and washed them all out, and that's how they got loose. I don't believe that. 
Because I was down years ago in Delaware Island working on soft shell crab tanks with a guy named Frank Lopez. He was an old fisherman who'd been down there forever. And we were talking about it. And I said, man, I just wish we could get it back. And he looked at him and said, you got no idea, son. He said, I used to hunt bear back here and deer. There were oak trees. He says, you know that nutrient? He says, I was a young boy. I saw the state come out with flatboats and cages with males and females in the cages. They put them in the marsh as an alternative fur with no idea what they would do. They're from Argentina. This is more like it. They're eating stuff in Louisiana. You want to know what they do? This is taking and fencing in an area of marsh. That's what it looks like when the new shit going through. And we've got millions of them. Look at this picture. These little dots, this is conglomeration. Each dot is a gas well. Each orange dot is an oil rig. Each blue line is a pipeline. Shows you what we've done with oil production. What's sad, though, is that we get less royalties than any other state in the union. How is that possible? I thought we had a quote, federal government, where everything should be the same. How is it that New Mexico gets so much more than we do? That's the problem. And that's what's hurting us now because the price of oil is down to $47 a barrel, and every dollar that we drop, I think we lose 12, 14 million, maybe more than that, in revenues. So that's what's hurting the state right now. But you can see how much production takes place here. Canals. These are the canals that they dug. And they were supposed to have dug them, this is 1945, and then filled them back in. That's when they're looking for oil and gas. But they never filled them back in because it costs money and nobody was making them do so. So over time, they added more canals. But because of these canals, a lot of salt water would come in and killed the surrounding marsh. That's what if you notice there's some suits that are taking place through the uh, Lake Horn Levee District in the Southeast Levee. District. That's what it's about. All this destruction that was done by these canals. They're going to try to get some mitigation to start building this back. Trouble is, how do you put it back? Nobody really knows. Because Mother Nature is an amazing little animal. And she does great things. We can't duplicate it. So, the levee system prevented the, pre the flow of the Mississippi River. It used to overflow with boundaries and flow everywhere. If you read DeSoto's uh, records, he talks about being suddenly in a lake because he was there for the spring flood. The levees prevented that from happening, so the silt that replenished the land just through overflowing of the spring floods and the fresh water that came through is gone. But being levee, the move back and forth is gone. So all the mechanisms for building Louisiana are now gone. Navigation canals, like Mr. Go, have cut up. You know, the salt water came in and destroyed more. Oil canals contributed to it. Oil drilling causes subsidence. You can't take oil out of something and not have it subside. But the big thing is, there's a general geological subsidence taking place on the plate we're in. That we can't fix. And that's what's causing a lot of the water to come in. Plus the storms that come through are washing away more and more each year. And it's less and less out there to be washed away. Local litigation, because when you try to come up with a plan to fix something, somebody has a reason for not getting it fixed, so they file suit, so everything is continually tied up in knots. We don't have any clarity of how to do it, and we have problems when we come up with an idea. And, of course, our little plan is the nutrient. So you put this all in combination, you see how complex the problem is with our wetlands. The result is disappearing. Louisiana is slowly disappearing. Now, let's look at the topography of New Orleans, why New Orleans had so many problems. There's one idea. <laughs> let's find the boat war. Don't call it the Isle of Orleans for nothing. We live on a damn island. You know, that's no question about it. You got the Mississippi River here, Lake Vaughan, Lake Pontchartrain, Lake Walpole, and you got the Everville Canal back there, Meat River, it's called now, going back there. That's the definition of, around, of an island surrounded by water. And then they sent it off a separate island when they cut the industrial canal and they made it another island when they put the violet canal in. So we carved ourselves into Venice. This is a great shot. A lot of people don't know this. In the early days when the storm came in, the flood water came in, it just washed in and washed out. The white areas are high, the dark areas are low. There's not one bowl, there's a bunch of bowls. This is the Metairie Ridge from the old bayou. This is Gentility Ridge here. 
from Bayou Chapinto, and the rivers, the like the Mississippi River, they would overflow the bayou. So the highest ground was actually on the bayou, and it was open back here. So the water could leave the city and go back. But then in the 1920s, they built a seawall system out in the lake with the airport. And they went out there, they dredged sand, and they built it up. Then in 1922, they built the industrial canal to connect the Mississippi River. Okay? So now when water came in, you can't get it out. you got to pump it out. And then since people were moving into these dark areas here, they started pumping anyway to take the water out because it was all marshy. And it's like taking the water out of a wet sponge. It sinks. So the land was sinking more and more and more. So you see the effects. Here's your canals right through here. This is the old basin canal. This is showing the elevations here in the water. So you can see one feet, two feet, zero feet. When you get some of these areas over here, you're four to eight feet below sea level. So if you want to know, find that dress and you know how bad off you are. This is a great graphic. But this is an elevation graph. You see one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. You take the line one and you look up here. And this is the elevations at that line, each one. Look at that. This is the Mississippi River. This is the lake. Now you see not the bowl, but the bowls. All of these dips. All of these dips. Because this is filled up to the levees, remember? So that's the amount of water that the city is vulnerable to. This is the industrial canal right here. That's how high that is. That's why that's always been a barrier that protected the city of New Orleans from the chaos of lower lands, lower New Orleans East, and say, you know what? That's why some of the brutal levy in Betsy, right? To protect the city. We don't know if that's true or not, but it's part of our tradition in war. So why not hang on to it? This is a scary scenario. This is a photograph. And this is taking the same thing and just showing those elevations one foot above sea level. Nah, that should keep you awake at night. We don't have a delta. <laughs> We're in a bad way. Hurricanes. Now we're getting into the real story. These are some of the past hurricanes. This is Betsy. Remember Betsy? Made a 360. Everybody said, oh, look, it's going out to East Coast. Oh, it's going out to sea. Oh, it's going south to Caribbean. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Kiss Miami on the right side of the black star clock, 1965. <laughs> this shows the storms, but this really isn't an up to it. I went down. To the, if you open up and go to the internet, you go to the severe storms, and you can go through every hurricane tracking from, from 1890. I just took them from 1965 to 2004. Now, 2005, when I first did the lecture, I was talking with Curtis was saying, because I was panicked, the year before the storm. 38 storms headed right from New Orleans and veered. I remember telling my wife, more, I said, you know, I got a bad shoulder from high school wrestling. If you give me 38 baseballs, I'll accidentally throw a strike. So it's not if, it's when. It's going to happen, and when it happens, it's not going to be pretty. That's why I brought out some magic. I had a place to go, man. I spent, I have been in a Pakistani motel in the door of Arkansas. No. <laughs> Once you do that. This year, the charts that we're talking about with Curtis. This is for the Corps of Engineers. This was done before the storm, one year before the storm. It's Hurricane Bessie. There's track A that Curtis was talking about. That's the one I was paranoid about. I said, you know, this is the one they said, if it is, it's going to do the most damage to the city of New Orleans, St. Bernard Parish in New Orleans East. Now look at that track, and look at Katrina. How close can you get to a bullseye? came right on through her. And here she was. She started off as a small storm, and if you remember, she crossed and she was down to a track of the storm below 45 miles an hour. The plan was, the modeling was, she turned off and went to Apologico. I tend to blame a lot of the problems in the, on the saints. <laughs> because that was before Drew Brees. You remember those games you 
play. And I remember seeing pictures of quarterback passing the ball, his eyes closed. He's like, that makes sense. I understand it now. So Friday night was the Saints game. And everybody went. And of course, everybody involved in the spirits and got drunk because what else do you do when you're losing team? So everybody came home and hit the rack and went to sleep. The next morning they got up late, had a little breakfast, cut the grass, brought the kids to the ballpark. So it wasn't until 5 30 when they caught Bob Breck and they said, What in God's name is going on? How is in matches? Moving the stuff. <laughs> 10 o'clock, I looked at the news, didn't have cable then, and they just got into the house like that. And I said, Well, that's not good. So I called my wife and came back from the game of the stadium. I said, Hey, look, no, no, I said, Something weird happened. They got the cone coming out of New Orleans. I said, well, there's good news and bad news here. The bad news is the cone goes to New Orleans. The good news is it never really goes where they first say it's going to go. This time it did. But the big thing was this. Everybody wants to bet. Say, well, category three, we can handle that. But at night, it became a cat five. What happened was a unique situation where they had what's called the loop count. They had two of them. And what happens is, as the storm comes across, it moves up the seas, and the surface temperature is 80 something degrees, but below that, the water gets pretty cool, and that's kind of a self regulator, keeps the storm from getting big. But with Katrina, in the loop car, the temperature goes down to 300 feet. So the more it stirred things up, the more hot water came up. It was like an engine. And then it became a Cat 5. And everybody waited until Sunday morning, and then it was, oh my. God. And how do you get so many people out of the city in such a short period of time? With really no plan to do it. And that's what happened. I remember seeing this picture. I told my wife, I said, no, baby, that's absolutely beautiful. It really is. It's a wonder of nature. It's a buzzsaw laying on its side and a car went right through our hearts and destroy everything in front of it. And it did. Look at the size of this thing. This is Tennessee. This is the Yucatan. This is west, the east of Florida. This is East Texas. This thing occupies, it's bigger than the Gulf of Mexico. It's amazing. It's a phenomenon. And then it came here. Look at that. It actually has an eye within an eye. It was insane. These are different pictures. As she spun and she started coming in. It is beautiful when you look at it from a meteorological perspective. It's, you know, it is a classic photograph of what a hurricane, a massive hurricane would be. And this is what we got. Because we did good. Like we called Curtis probably right before it crossed. <laughs> Not that. But when it crossed here and the north wind came in, it pushed all that water against the levee system. Mr. Go. 1965 Hurricane Betsy came through. At that time, I had my favorite car, which I still have. 1958 Champion Power 348 Black with a white top. It's 1965 Super Sport Hubcaps. And they would be on the door and said, Get your cars out of here because the London Avenue Canal broke. So we jumped in our cars and we fled. Well, it wasn't true. And that was perhaps one of the greatest. Quotes of a politician I ever heard when Vic Skiro and his rank girl in civil defense cap said, Don't believe any false rumors till you hear them from me. <laughs> <laughs> think about that a second. But they planned to put gates at the head of the outfall canals in 1965, and they didn't do it. And 35 years later, when Katrina's North Wind came in, all that water went up those canals so the levees couldn't take it anymore and the levees breached. And with us, the levees collapsed. This is another view of coming in. Look at the impact. These are the barrier islands. That's before, that's after. Before, this arrow shows what's left. After. This is, like, this is July. This is August. Isn't that beautiful? We used to go fishing out there. Childhood was that, right? Sit down and start fishing. Try that now. No. Look how beautiful it is. Nothing. And nothing's been done to rebuild it because
because the EPA says you can't do that because you're messing with nature. I think nature messed with us a little bit here. And barrier offense play an important role because they keep down the tidal currents from coming in. That's what they call it. barrier islands. This is the world. This is what happened. This is the 17th Street Canal break. Remember that couple before the storm kept saying, my backyard's wet. I got salt water. Oh, no, 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 that's that fetch rain. It don't rain salt water. That's salt water. Ready to break? The guy's backyard. That way he said it. Right here's the London Avenue Canal. Well, Vic was wrong the first time, but he was right the second time. And then, of course, here we've got the Industrial Canal levy, and here's where it broke by us coming in. So talking to Brian Batusi, he said he remembers at the hospital the water came from the ninth floor first, and the next thing, all the debris that passed in front of him going this way was going the other way at a faster pace as the water breached over Mr. Go and came flooding in. So we've got a, a left and a right. This is showing the depth on the second, so the tidal surge that you saw in the film with Baccarella to the top of the roofs, once that surge came in, it washed out and the water stayed. This is the standing water showing how much water you've lost in the entire city. This amazes me at this day as you drive around, no matter where you go in New Orleans, it was under eight feet of water, 10 feet of water. What we've done in putting the city back together is absolutely phenomenal. We're kind of like ants. Maybe you mess up an ant pile and two days later it's all back again. We're pretty industrious. This is the break of the 17th Street Canal. This is after they dropped all those sandbags on it. Tried to put this poor guy's house, the guy kept saying, I'm not going to go back. No, he's gone. Guess I solved that problem. Here's a break from the aerial shot. So, so that's when it breached. And once it came in, it started flowing. Tom Street Union said that they sent riders and bicycles down and so did the sound of water to bicycle back and was almost beating them back to the station. This is the uh, Industrial Canal Bridge. I find this interesting. So I don't know, it must have broken. I don't know why. Uh, you see that barge there? You think that might have had something to do with it? I remember talking to an old black man in the ninth ward right after the storm. And he said, you know, it was about 6 o'clock in the morning. I heard this tremendous bang. He says, the next thing, the water came in. And then he started crying. He said, you know, so mom was holding their babies dead floating in front of my house. You know, I really believe that's why it broke. It was rammed. That was an unsecured barge. This is the water coming back out after the surge. This is Brad Pitt's there. I call it Dr. Zeus Man. That's weird. <laughs> no offense to Brad. I appreciate the fact that he, he did what he did. Come on. I mean, really? This is the water in the city at the time. Look how close it is. Thankful my daughter was here in the Bible water. She only had uh, 18 inches of water in the street for an hour. Because the high, the closer you get to the river, the higher the land is. We know that same not. If there's a heavy rain, do you take Judge Perez? No. You <laughs> take the highway. Why? Because you're going to lose your car if you take Judge Perez. So, but look at that, an entire city on the water. And here's St. Paul Parish. This is a map of all the levee breaches. Breaches are in red, topped is moderate. The levee's gone. I remember talking to Bob Turner from the uh, Lakeborn Levee District at the time. He said, I don't know what the hell A kid takes a handful of mud and throws it, and you see it splatter. He says, that's what that looked like. He says, the levees were just knocked down and splattered, and the water just pulled it in all the way around. The whole levee system. These are the breaches in the industrial canal. That's what got us. Then this is the back levee system that went down as well. This is the amount of water that was in the parish on the 31st, two days later. So the tidal surge is gone, but you can still see, this is a little high area here, this is Paris Road, but you can see the amount of water still in the entire parish. This is New Orleans East. And that's what you look like. A little blurry, but that's it. Charles was here, right, Charles? I remember calling and talking to Jeffrey. His son, he was on top of the roof. And I called on my cell phone and said, Jeffrey, what's it like? He goes, Uncle Ron, it's Lake Chalmette. I said, what? This is during the tidal surge. He said, the only thing sticking out of the water is the second story of peaks of houses and the tops of trees. It's down Lake Chalmette. Amazing. This will cost school. This is the standing water. 
You can see how high it is. See the water lines. I mean, they have a water line, that's after the surge. Because the surge is not really going to leave. The water line it comes in and goes out too quick. It's going to sit and it's going to go down. So you get a series of water lines. It's like the reverse of watching a child grow. Remember those boats? The beat with your hearts? Say, God, how do you get rid of that? <laughs> like, I don't know. <laughs> it's just, you know, I know it's quiet. Absolutely amazing. You can go duck hunting up there because you got your own blind. <laughs> House has moved off of its foundation. That's my shop. This, sadly, is a 30-foot catch I was working on, and it caught it. It was crushed. But look at the mud and oil, because I was in the oil zone. That's my neighbor's house. That's my house, Christmas, a couple of years before. And actually, it didn't sustain that much physical damage. I was surprised these two were in the state. The rest of it was gone. I want to talk about the inside. <laughs> that was the house. This is past, you see all the water, this is the oil line on the house. You see, I had plywood and screwed everything in. 9 11. Really? But that's what it was. I don't know if y'all remember that, some of y'all going around and put an X on the door. 9 11 is the day where they got there. This is the number of dead people they found. This is the number of live people they found. And this is the people who did the designation. Every house, as they cleared the house, they put that mark on it. They passed my house 9 11. That's the inside. You can see the water line. It's about six feet. My house is four feet off the ground. So that's 10 feet of water to the slab, but then that's about three feet of the slope to the street. So you had enough water in front of my house to probably do the 30 meter Olympic high platform dive. It's just kind of hard to wrap your brain around. Who is that? <laughs> my lovely bride, all dressed up and ready to go and got a house. Remember that? Rubber boots, rubber gloves, Pyrex suit, masks. Good store them up. I'm going to pay for that one, huh? You know? Had to, baby. Had to. That's the inside of the house. It's like cracking it open. You know, like, well, that's a rotten egg. I think that picture sums it up in so many ways. This little soaking teddy bear and everything destroyed around it. It's a beautiful shot. Then we have the Murphy Oil spill. This big tank was sitting there, and as I understand the story, they're supposed to keep a certain amount of oil in it so it doesn't become buoyant. And what happened was they didn't do that. So it became buoyant. As the floodwaters came, I think you should listen. As the floodwaters came in, it rose up. But the compound thing, someone left a piece of heavy equipment down. And so when it came down, it landed on it, breached the side of it. 25,000 gallons. 1,050,000 gallons of oil was filled on top of the floodwater. And put all the water. And they spread everything below Paris Road. And it's Paris Road, by the way. P A R I S. <laughs> Can't get that straight. <clears throat> so, what happened? Lessons of Hurricane Betsy, 1965. What did that lesson do? They didn't protect the outflow canals. They didn't keep the water from coming in. No floodgates were erected anywhere around. Levees along this ago were not raised. I was trying to find it. I can't. I remember I had a it's called a profile map, a flood, a levee profile map. They had sailors. There you go. 13, no, 14.75 foot levee out there. Then they actually measure it. And when I was talking to uh, Dan Kaluta about it, he brought them out to the office before the storm. Some of the parts of the levee were 12 and a half feet, 13 feet. Down towards New Orleans, they were 10 and a half feet. I said, Dan, let me ask you something. I said, one of the problems we have is supply, right? In the shop. I said, what do they measure this height from? He said, they got a medallion, a geodesic medallion, on um, a cement pillow. I said, when was the last time they measured the height of the medallion? Because it's so silent, too. 1984. So this 14.75 foot designated levy that was measured at 12 and a half was probably close to 10. 
But for all in modeling, we have 14.7 bar money up there, right? It's computers. Levees are long way gone. We never constructed. They were supposed to put them in, they never did. The barrier islands were allowed to deteriorate, that would provide some protection. And the federal government, I remember we had them here before the storm, where I got some of the slides, I said, why don't you build Cat 5 Levees? He said, do you realize that might cost $10 billion? No, we got $100 billion to clean up the damn mess. If they'd have done things right, we wouldn't have had the problem. But they built those levees out of the spoil from digging it out. They didn't build proper levees. And we paid for it. The catastrophic fa levy, failure of the levee system destroyed St. Bernard. It wasn't the storm. The storm precipitated it. But it was the levee system that did it. In. The future? New levees and pump stations have been brought in to provide protection. We have a ring now from Plaquemines Parish all the way to Jefferson Parish. The cost of maintenance, though, is on us. They built it and threw us the keys. I remember when they were here, and they were dedicated, right here on the stage here, they had guys from the Corps of Engineers, and I said, oh, you know, we have a kind of problem with subsidence. He says, yeah. So we're always building up the levees because they sink, and the more weight you put on them, the more they sink because of our stuff. He says, yeah, I know that. I said, well, oh, you put sheet piling and a cement T-wall on top. He goes, yeah. I said, what happens when the mud underneath subsides? He goes, we haven't figured that out yet. But they threw us the keys. In other words, no. And that's part of the problem we have. Now, we are paying taxes to maintain 76 miles of the levee system to protect ourselves in New Orleans. We don't have statewide a unified system. Each locale has to pay in. We're getting it in the neck because we have to pay for most of it. Indications of science would become a problem earlier than planned. Just recently, they said they thought they had 100 years of that levee system. Well, it might be 50. Well, if it's 52 years after you built it, I guess it's like 20 in the next two years, three years. No real means of raising the levees. I just discussed that. This is my big one. When Curtis talked about me panicking about the idea of a hurricane coming, well, I got a new panic for you. They don't have any holes in the levee. Think about that. Why do we build levees on the Mississippi River? To keep the water in, right? You're a tourist. You're sitting in the, in the city, and you look up, and I love to see that in the French Quarter, and they see a ship passing, and they stare at it, because they realize they're looking up at a ship. <laughs> Wait a minute. What's keeping that river back? Oh, mud. Really? <laughs> I think it's time for me to check out. We're stuck here. What happens if that high water, a ship hits that levee and it crevasses and the water comes in? That levee system that surrounds us is going to keep the water in. That levee system is 25 feet high. And a crevasse like that, it will fill the entire levee system up with water probably within a day or two. And you're not going to stop the water because you can't stop the Mississippi River. It's not like a storm surge that's going to come in and go out. It's coming down, baby. It's the Ohio, it's the Missouri, it's the Mississippi, it's the Red, it's the Arkansas, it's the Tennessee. The entire floodway is working its way down here. And nobody's thinking about what happens if the bright field, instead of hitting the, uh, <coughs> what is it? Um, like the whole malls out there, had hit a bare levee and breached it. That's something to think about. The Mississippi River. That's the threat to the back. And finally, this is our flood elevation map today. This is what we pay our flood insurance on. And this is the levee system that surrounds it. This is what we have to worry about. Is this rain here is what's going to hold the water in in the event of a breach of the Mississippi River levee, where it protects us from water coming from every other direction. The Corps thinks of fighting last year's problem. That's it. Thank you so much.